Thank you and welcome. My name is Mike Wilson. I am the Executive Director of AIA East Bay. And today we have for you the ins and outs of low carbon concrete. This is presented by the, our Committee on the Environment, Panko Builders, and Central Concrete. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Evan Jacobs with Brick to introduce our speakers today. Evan? Great. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so back in August, um, uh, Mike and Juan invited a group of engineers out to a Treasure Island to Central Concrete's uh, concrete plant uh, for a tour and a, a presentation uh, where they talked about um, low carbon concrete. It was a, a very intriguing presentation. So uh, Michael and I got together uh, after that and said, well, you know, we should be presenting this to a, a, a larger group of architects. So um, got hooked up with Coat. And uh, here we are. Um, so I want to introduce uh, Michael Strong. Michael Strong is a project executive with uh, Panko Builders. Uh, in, in addition to his extensive work uh, throughout the Bay Area, he has a, a particular focus in sustainable design. So uh, this led uh, him and, and Juan Gonzalez uh, to start to collaborate. Uh, Juan Gonzalez is a, a manager of strategic development and sustainability uh, for Central Concrete and at the forefront of all the hard work that they're doing, uh, reducing the carbon footprint of concrete. Uh, so with that, we're going to start with uh, with Michael and then and then Juan will um, we'll follow up with uh, more detail with um, low carbon concrete. Hey, Evan. Great. Thank you for the introduction, Mike. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. So good to, well, actually, I can't see everybody, but I can see a really cute cartoon here, but I hope everybody's doing well today. And uh, I look forward to a pretty good discussion here. We've still got 58 minutes left. So uh, as Evan mentioned, I'm Michael Strong. I'm with Panko Builders. Uh, you can see the graphic on the wall behind me. And we did. We had a really good meeting out there with, with Johnny and the Central Concrete team. And I can't believe it's 2021, the end of the year, and we're talking about concrete, right? I mean, no one's talked about concrete in 30 years, I think, in our industry. We've just kind of taken it for granted. Concrete's concrete. It's what holds things up and holds things together and stops things from falling down. And now I guess we've come full circle of all the amazing technologies and changes that we're seeing technologically uh, from a constructability perspective, the amazing design opportunities, the reimagining that all of you are doing that we get to fulfill. Um, and we're talking about concrete, right? We used to joke about watching paint dry or watching concrete cure, but um, concrete is in fact, one of the most exciting opportunities to discuss today. And, you know, I reached out to Johnny last summer and said, this whole carbon thing, it's, it's, it's really, it's really bugging me and I, I need a better understanding of what it's about and, and what you, right? I put the burden of the carbon footprint of concrete onto Johnny's shoulders are, are doing about it. And he put together a really fantastic presentation that, that Evan referred to earlier. And when we did this presentation, we had everybody at Panko from our CEO to uh, an intern who'd been with us six weeks in attendance. And, and Johnny brought everything, everybody from their CEO to their intern. It was a very great discussion and a really good tour. And we started it with this uh, cartoon right here. Uh, and I, and I, just, I just absolutely love this cartoon. Let's not sweat the, sweat the small stuff. You can see the little comet out there. Uh, in the background, these two dinosaurs that said, it's probably not anything we have to worry about. Of course, you can see I added carbon uh, to the label of what that uh, comet represents. And I, and I do think it represents a comet. And I could just speak for the next 45 minutes just on this cartoon, but it is a comet. It's, it's on its way. It's coming at us. And we collectively, as a civilization on the planet, as a society here in the United States, uh, and as as the AEC community have to do our part for the next generation to make sure that we don't go the way of dinosaurs. So I really like this. Obviously you all are leaders here. That's what this cartoon referred to is how the best leaders don't wait for the future to arrive. They provoke it. So thank you all for finding time in your week to be here. Johnny, if you could move to the next slide. I wanna show a, a quick little video here. This video is not quick minute video, but we're just going to play the two minutes, maybe just a couple of minutes, Johnny, maybe when it hits the two minute mark, uh, you can stop it. And, uh... yeah. As Girl Scouts, trying to make the 
world a better place is part of the fun. So one day, during our troop meeting, we could do a project about climate change because it's so important. Well, what contributes most to climate change? Are there any big things people haven't heard much about yet? What if we did concrete? <laughs> Concrete. After doing some research, we learned building materials like concrete are an important part of the climate change issue and even part of the solution. When it comes to solving climate change, we usually think about stuff like solar panels, wind farms, electric cars, or even LED lights. But materials, they're important too because of how they're made. First, there's mining, quarrying, or harvesting, then processing, and don't forget transportation. Each of those steps requires energy, and since most of our energy still comes from fossil fuels, that means CO2 gets released for each step. Added together, those CO2 emissions are the carbon footprint, or the embodied carbon of a material. While well, materials have embodied carbon, we're zooming in on concrete because we use more of it than any other material. All those new roads, runways, buildings, bridges, parking structures, and even pipes add up to a whopping 8% of global carbon emissions each year. First, That's to great, be Johnny. Clear, yeah, that was perfect, Johnny. You can move to the next slide. So. I mean, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that just a, just a fabulous little video, right? You don't have to see the first, you don't have to see beyond the first two minutes to know those nine minutes are really going to be some amazing content by that next generation that I was referring to earlier, right? If we don't take responsibility for cleaning up our mess or, or improving the planet that we've been giving, that next generation is already prepared. Those, uh, those Girl Scouts are, it's an amazing uh, video and this presentation will be made available to everybody. Uh, we'll work through the details with Evan and Mike, but we'll make sure everybody gets a copy. And I hope you take the time to look at that, that video and see just how smart uh, those, those girls are. So real quickly, before we get into the meat of uh, the carbon footprint of concrete and some of the solutions, uh, some of the proven solutions that exist out there in the marketplace and where we're going in the future, just want to tell you a little bit about uh, Panco. So we're based here in California, uh, Southern California. Or vertical commercial contractor. We're mid-sized. We're about a half a billion dollars a year, which is pretty small in volume for a company that does projects in excess of $100 million. Uh, and we work primarily in the San Francisco Bay Area and down in the, in the greater Los Angeles area. Uh, our mission is to reimagine the building experience through human innovation. And I think, I think this topic of of being proactive and not simply being order takers uh, shows uh, the equity that we're willing to put into the conversation, the mistakes that we're willing to make through human innovation to reimagine a better building experience for all of us as well as our owners. Our vision, you can see this, you don't need me to, uh, to read all of this to you, but we do really try to deliver value in everything we do. And I've had the pleasure of working alongside some of you out there in the audience today. And, and I hope you understand that that is part of our DNA. We really do, really do try to deliver value in everything that we do. Uh, these are our values. And um, one value in particular that I think is, I think is really notable, notice, notable is the third value. Mistakes are inevitable and they're invaluable. Uh, we don't portend to be perfect, uh, but we do try uh, and we do strive for perfection every time, but we understand that mistakes are made by every person on the project team. And we try to support uh, every person on the project team when those mistakes are made. So we succeed together and we fail together. And I think a hallmark of, of working with Panco is gonna be the collaborative spirit in which we do support all members of the team. Uh, these are the markets that we build in uh, and we renovate in. And then, Johnny, I think the last slide. Uh, mm -hmm. You can see the diversity and the tenure of our leadership here at Panco. We like to consider ourselves, at least in this neck of the woods in the Bay Area, one of 
the area's best kept secrets when it comes to general contractors. And we pride ourselves on the diversity of the leadership team uh, here in the company. So I'm gonna turn the microphone over now to Johnny. Um, I think Mike, unless you grab the microphone and say otherwise, the best way to address questions that anybody has is through the chat box. Uh, and then we can follow up with our email addresses at the end or our cell phone numbers if anybody wants to follow up after that. But otherwise, I'm going to turn this agenda over uh, to Johnny Gonzalez, my good friend with Central Concrete. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, uh, the team here, for uh, you know offering us and letting us present here to this group here in, Oak, in, in the East Bay. So the agenda for low carbon concrete, as you can see here, we're going to just look at um, why low carbon concrete and how we measure it. And then we'll dive into the different strategies in achieving um, low carbon concrete. And then how do we implement it, right? What's the best way to take advantage of all these different strategies? Um, um, first, I'd like to introduce the local infrastructure on concrete plants that we service here in the Bay Area. You can see here by the pins, we, we have operation in San Jose of the peninsula into San Francisco, across the, the bridge into East Bay, Oakland, Hayward, and then part East Bay up to Martinez, Brentwood, and Pleasanton. In order to make concrete, we need our in our um, raw materials, which here are the quarries that we, um, where we pull aggregates from, from our customers. Um, we have, of course, and find aggregate quarries here identified on the map. We also work with recyclers because um, we use recycled aggregate in our concrete mixes. This is more in, in, in San Francisco, Oakland territories where um, there are specifications that allow for the use of recycled concrete aggregate and creating a true closed loop system when it comes to concrete. These are terminals. I know sometimes um, we have to import high quality aggregates. So there's some terminals that they get imported to. And also, um, you know, now this market here, it's a hundred percent import market on, on all powders, including cement. Um, so these terminals are very useful. We had in, in 2020, yeah, year 2020 in April, before the whole shutdown began, or just right after, actually, I should say, um, we had a cement plant locally here that serviced 50% of our concrete production in the Bay Area, not only ours, but the total concrete production in the Bay Area. It was under um, Lehigh Hansen. Um, it was Cupertino Permanente. Um, Kaiser was, you know, it was originally developed by Kaiser um, back in early 19. You know, 1990s or no sorry again 1900 and um so unfortunately this plan has been forced to decommission and it had to do with some environmental um, um appeal battles they had to deal with with the community there um there were new developments that were getting closer to that facility um there were some issues that they had to work through which my understanding is they did they did some implementations to improve the um the environmental um, requirements that they had to meet. But unfortunately, ultimately, the neighbors around that neighborhood just really wanted them out. And now we're importing cement from further distances. And unfortunately, those imports are from countries that don't have the tight restrictions like we do here in California. So, you know, you just try to look at, we have to, when we talk about sustainability, we have to look at the whole approach and a holistic approach. And, you know, is it better to import it in those far distances and in regions that don't have tight environmental requirements or, or keep it locally here in California? Um, so diving into how we measure low carbon concrete, you know, you could look at the cement content in a mix design or you look at the environmental product declarations. And um, EPDs is short for environmental product declaration. What it's looking at is a life cycle assessment within a system boundary on the production stage. Um, A1 being the extraction, all the environmental impacts of the upstream production of uh, raw material, the transportation of that raw material to our manufacturing plants, and then the manufacturing um, processes, whether it's waste, the energy, the fuels, all these environmental impacts are collected, taken together, and EPDs are produced. Metrics within an EPD, can see highlighted below, but there's one metric that we use to really try to dial back down and, and, and 
and look at the environmental impact control on CO2 emissions, and that's global warming, global warming potential. Um, and you know, we we work on on projects early on and try to identify how how can identify strategies that we could take advantage, which I'll show a little later to really bring that number down. You know, and looking at concrete at the embodied carbon, why do we want to bring that bring that number down? It's because it's the second most consumed material in the world. And although concrete itself doesn't generate a lot of a large amount of greenhouse gas emissions, there is a constituent that goes into it, which is that Portland cement. There's an industry average out there that it's one ton of Portland cement produced produces about a, a ton of CO2. That number is slowly going down with you know, these cement manufacturers looking at different ways to um, be more sustainable, whether it's fuel switching um, and just having better efficiencies at their plant. Johnny, if I could real quick, <clears throat> I just really want to underline this. So when, when we talk about, and you're going to get into it in a little bit, the various components of what makes uh, concrete, it's the cement that has the largest footprint. So that's kind of um, something to, that I want to flag right now. So when you get to that slide, people are looking for that. It, it's the sure. cement within the concrete that has the big footprint. And to put that first bullet into, into context, concrete is the second most consumed material. If concrete were a country, and Johnny, correct me if I'm wrong, it would be the third largest emitter. Yeah. It would have the third largest embodied carbon mm -hmm. footprint of any country in the world, right? Yeah, that is correct. So it's, it it's, it's a big deal. It's a really big deal if you think about it in those terms. Yeah, and, and you know, like you said, cement's that big, that big material that, that brings all that energy of the greenhouse gas emissions. And I'm glad to say the cement producers now, they're really, they have different strategies on what they're trying to implement. They're, they're trying to go through the promotion of those different strategies. And it's gonna, there's, it's gonna be, a collaboration approach from the policy level. Um, that's why I wanted to bring up that policy or not, you know, those issues that happened with Cupertino um, because eh, we need to, in order to tackle this issue here, we all need to work together and, and look at the best, the best approach. So, um, you know, on cement manufacturing, um, there's two impacts that really come from that production. One is the use of fossil fuel. You will, um, the cement producers have to heat the kiln up to 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so there's a lot of fossil fuels being generated. Um, and then there's the chemical reaction that occurs where limestone, as limestone is being mined, limestone goes through this kiln process. And before it becomes cement or cement clinker, there's a chemical reaction occurring, which releases CO2, it's called calcination. And that calcination process is about 60% of the greenhouse gas emissions. So it's kind of you know, hard to avoid that. Um, but there's different ways that we could um, reduce the amount of cement in concrete, um, use different types of cement that we could uh, implement, which we'll talk about as well here a little later, and also just that fuel switching. And this is a graph just to look at a concrete mix design based off of their different constituents. So you have three different mixes for each of these different colors of, um, of um, bar on the bar graph here. You have a 100% cement and gray, a 15% um, cement, 15% fly ash mix, and a 50% um, replacement mix with fly ash and slag. And you can see the impacts of each of these constituents. The majority of that constituent, or the majority of that impact is really coming from cement. And this is what Michael was talking about. And this is from the um, GWP, um, from our EPDs, and we're looking at GWP from the production stage from A1 to A2. So now going into the different strategies that we have, and Michael, you know, if, while I'm talking here, you know, feel free to jump in and, and add anything that I'm missing or, or even some more color and content to it. So one of the, you know, the main strategy that we really try to focus it's really cutting down the cement in our mix designs. And that's through the use of supplementary cementitious materials. It's, you know, it's, and we use SEMs for short. Um, here in this market, we have three cementitious materials. Um, the ones here circled is fly ash and slag. It's what we have available. We also have natural pozzolans available, um, which didn't have an image of that, but that's something that we use in, in the Far East Bay today. 
And uh, I did like to point out that there's a new ASTM standard that allows the use of glass, um, recycled glass and glass porcelain. Um, unfortunately, here in this market, there hasn't been um, it hasn't there hasn't been a producer to to use and to manufacture recycled glass and create a porcelain out of it. I do know our operations in New York are using recycled glass for that for for their concrete. And here's a graph just to show three different mixes. They're all 6,000 PSI at 20 a day. And you can see the different cement replacements. You have 100% cement in gray, a 50% replacement, the one there in the middle in red, and the 70% replacement um, there at the end. And they're all being compared to their GWPs of each of these mix designs. The 50% replacement has a 45% GWP reduction. And the 70% replacement has a 60% GWP reduction. Um, 50%, we could call that you know, business as, the, as usual for us. We produce that every day. That's being produced now. 70%, that's also being produced today. We do have a few mixes going out. Um, but you have limited applications where you could really try to utilize that. Um, you know, you really want to focus on any underground work, um, any vertical work and columns. Um, if you have high early, you really want to stay away from that, or even any flat work and try to finish just because um, you don't have the, the heat of hydration, um, that early heat of hydration coming in because you could, it, it, it is susceptible to more cracking if it's not cured correctly, or you don't have extra additives. If, you know, we are trying to investigate how do we optimize these next things to get the performance that our contractors need. And, um, and that's through additives such as fibers, such as uh, maybe even some SRA or whatnot. But um, there's different ways and approaches to really take advantage of that. And we just, it's, it's, it's identifying that and piloting it with the, with, the, with the customer. Giovanni, could you go back two slides real quick? <clears throat> One more. Yep, I guess, there we go. So, Again, you can see achieving low carbon concrete. These are re reduction strategies, and there are six of them listed, right? So this, you know, this is the spoiler alert. If you just take a minute and you look at the numbers, um, the folks at Carbon Cure are they they've got a great product and they've got a great marketing team, and we've got a great relationship with them as to Central. Uh, and we'll talk more about Carbon Cure but they're kind of sucking all the oxygen out of the room when it comes to the conversation about how we make low carbon concrete. So the slides that Johnny just went through the SCMs, you can see, you can get 15 to 70% cement replacement. You know, that is huge. That's the non-glamorous unsexy way of reducing the carbon footprint in our concrete mixes. Carbon Cure is down at the three to 5% cement reduction. So if you just take a look at those numbers and, and, and as Johnny will continue to go into greater detail, there is no silver bullet here for everybody, right? That's the spoiler alert. You're not gonna just work with your structural engineer and your owner and your general contractor and, and with Central and say, okay, let's put Carbon Cure into everything throughout the building and then our problem goes away. It doesn't go away. It's Carbon Cure's part of the solution, but it's not the only, the only piece in the mosaic um, of how we're gonna solve this together. So I just thought this was worth a pause, trying to put all those red numbers into context uh, as you move forward through these slides. Thank you, Michael. So yes, we showed the cement replacements at different percentages, very at high end of um, percent, um, cement replacement percentage. And that, not, it's very common here in the Bay Area, but in other markets, not so common. But another opportunity where, where we see it more often here, maybe not others, is using SCNs for high early applications. Um, here on the, down below, there's two different measurements. You have GWP and cement content in a mix design for two mixes that are 100% cement, they're in gray, and then a 30% um, cement replacement. It has 30% slag in it. And you can just see for a post-tension traditional mix that we cement, 3,000 PSI at three days, you could have a 22% reduction on your GWP um, compared to that first 100% cement mix, and a 36% reduction on cement content in the mix of that. Um, so these are strat you know different strategies we like to implement, and and you know our direct customers may have concerns of using SEMs for high replacement mixes, 
there's a technology out there, but I may talk about it a little later, depending on time, but we have maturity. And this is a great way for, for our contractors to feel comfortable on high early um, requirements so they don't avoid the critical path to their schedule. Maturity probes is a sensor that gets embedded in concrete and reads the temperature delta. And from that temperature delta, we could determine what that early age strength of that in place concrete is. Really recommend this for, for, um, you know, for high early applications if you need to remove forms, post tensions that have a lot of um, SCN, have a, a large amount of um, cement replacement in them. This is, um, this graph has a lot of information here. And this is what it's trying to say, what we're trying to convey here in this graph is SCMs are not, you know, they're great for, for reducing your embodied carbon, your GWP, but that's not what the only, that's not the only benefit you get with, with using SCMs. The other benefit is looking at your permeability or concrete or your durability or concrete. And here you have three different family of mixes, 100% cement, 25% flash, 50% um, replacement or turn is what we call it. And it's all being compared to the permeability of rapid, uh, rapid chloride. It's a RCP testing that we've done in our lab. And you can see the penetration of those chlorides reduce as you increase your um, SCM content in a mix design. And we had massive builders do an analysis for us on Life 360, Life 365, and the surface life on, on those type of concretes, you can see the trend line increase. Um, and that's you know the benefit of reducing the embodied carbon of a concrete mix design and also um, taking advantage of its performance on durability. Basically saying lower the your embodied carbon, you know, you have a longer service. Johnny, right there, <clears throat> I'd like to take a moment and pause before you move on to the next strategy. Um, we're getting a lot of technical questions that come in. And I don't want to get to the end of the presentation and then we're try to reference the technical questions with the sure. particular slide. So Mike, if you could maybe uh, pull a couple of those first round of questions that came in before we get too far along in the slides, and then we can go back as needed to either reference those slides or Johnny can answer them right off the cuff. Uh, sure, well, let's start with Tyler Bradshaw. He had a question on the horizontal, on the horizontal bar, why is the phi ash at 15% resulting in a much less than 15% carbon reduction against 100% Portland cement? So that was so, early discussion. The fifteen percent was lower. So you had the cement. Where we're talking about the different constituents, right? Here, yep. this the yeah. So we have fifty a uh, five zero fifty percent replacement. So in that in that mix design here, it had a GWP of three hundred and thirty three. With that amount of replacement. Cement is contributing to about 74% of the, to the GWP. 15% replacement um, mix design had a GWP of 430 and the cement was contributing about, you know, above around 80, what was that? 88%. And then for hundred percent, it was a, for 100% cement mix design, it was contributing, cement was contributing up to 90% of the GWP. Great, if uh, the answers that are given want more clarification, just put that into the chat. Uh, Ellen Owens has a question. What is the impact on strength when fly ash or slag replace cement in the mix? So the strength, right? We talked about strength and and look, this is a graph that identifies three different mix designs with three different types of um, cement replacements. We're the concrete, right? We, we're, in the, we're in the lab trying to establish if the design strength requires a certain PSI, that's something that we could tweak in the lab and try to meet any project goals. Um, you know, there, you do have early age strength requirements that we may want to consider. Um, right, like we talked about using 30% slag for a high early post tension. Um, we are currently investigating, can we increase that? And how can we modify our mixes to increase that cement replacement for, for, um, for those applications? So um, we really, you know, we really don't, 
have, you know, that's where the lab really comes in in that testing to really try to optimize mix designs to achieve the project's requirements. Um, your initial set, that's another question that usually comes up. These mixes will have a slower initial set time. So that what that means is the contractors may have to wait a little longer before they get on top of the slab. Um, and 50% replacement is more common in this area. So they are more familiar on how to handle and work that type of mix design. Most contractors out here in this market, um, in other markets, that that's going to be new stuff for them. They're not going to, it's going to be a challenge and they may have to take time just to change that. Um, you know, it's all about that perception and understanding of how to work and, and finish a concrete mix. Thanks, Johnny. Uh, one more from uh, Nick Downend. Um, SCMs usually allow for concrete products to reach required strengths, but it typically takes longer. So re can you react to that statement? Yeah, similar to this, um, for the second question there. Um, your fly ash, you do get, your fly ash and your slag do um, promote later age strengths. That, that is true. Um, and, you know, this 28 number, um, you know, 28, we need our PSI 28 days. And that's one of the strategies that we have here in specifications. Um, you know, if we're looking to optimize um, embodied carbon in our concrete buildings, um, we should look at specifications and maybe tweak them if we can, especially if 28 number, I, we don't know where that comes from. That's a, it's a number that's been developed and used for years, but can we extend that to 56 days? Um, but if we need 28 days, we could get you a mix design that you need um, with varying SEM percentages like we see here on this graph. So last question before we move on from James Goring, when will carbon capture aggregate likely be in the market like Blue Planet? That's a great question. Um, that is a great question. We are we work closely with Blue Planet um, and the developments and different types of aggregates. I am aware of their Pittsburgh facility. They have this plant up, um, not up and running, but they have the property. They're waiting on permits at the moment to plumb in the CO2 from Calpine, their neighbors that releases CO2. Um, it's, a, um, it's a plant and power plant out there. And they, I, last time I spoke with them, they're anticipating maybe the end of 2022 where they could have some aggregate available for us to test. Um, there is other technologies available like uh, for Terra. Um, that's, that's another, uh, that's another similar type of technology, but um, they're not making aggregate with it. They want to make SCMs with it and blend the cements with it. It's Lehigh Hansen or now Martin Marietta. Um, they acquired that division out here in California, and they're 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 working on a similar type of technology, sequestering CO two and making the SCM with it. Johnny, I just want to help you manage your clock. I know you got a lot going on over there. We're we're at sure. call it twelve thirty five. It looks like 25 minutes or so. Yeah, okay. I have a two -time timer here, so thank you. Appreciate it, Michael. Um, any other questions I should answer before continuing? Nope, I think you're good to go. Oh, so another strategy is the type of cement that we're using in our concrete, or really is in our specification, right? Because we make concrete based off specifications. Here in California, traditionally, we specify or it's been specified it, um, to use an AS, a, a C-150 cement and it's based off of the AS, ASTM. This type of cement has about 5% limestone or can use 5% limestone. Normally producers are using about 3%. And the reason we're, we're using this is because Caltrans, right? They're the ones that really specify. Um, we're specifying this limit because it had to do with some sulfate attacks or some issues with the soils, but they just finished a three-year study with the state of Washington, and now they're accepting a cement type that is that falls under the designation of ASCM C595, and this has 15, this type of cement allows up to 15% more, or a total of 15% limestone, and what that means is, you know, in the extraction process, when cement manufacturing, um, they, as they mine that limestone and they grind that limestone, instead of that limestone going through that kiln process at super high temperatures, they're diverting more of that limestone and avoiding that, that calcination process and the, um, the use of the fossil fuels to, 
to generate more clinker. And that's about 10 more, you know, that's 10% more being diverted from the kiln process. Today we're using type 1L um, in the smaller operations that we have. Um, it's called Advanced, Advancement HS from Cal Portland. And we're just waiting on the adoption for from all the cement producers. Mind you, we talked about we're 100% import market. So it may take a little longer here in the Bay Area because we don't have local cement producers manufacturing it. They're working with um, other cement um, manufacturers across, you know, across the globe. Just to show the that percentage reduction when you're looking at type 1L compared to the industry average from Portland Cement Association, that's a 16% reduction on your GWP when we're using type 1L cement. Looking at atom mixtures, we talked about, um, you know, Michael mentioned carbon cure. Here we have eight plants through Central Concrete that have carbon cure. We've done over 550,000 cubic yards and 500 projects. It's um, it's recycled CO2 being collected by an emitter. Um, it goes through a purification process, um, which is an industry that, are, that already exists, and that's the food and beverage industry. And that purified CO2 gets delivered to our plants and, and stored in these containers that we have here at the last image here. And that gets plumbed into our ready mix plant. Every concrete that's being dosed, we could inject CO2, reduce the cementitious content if we're able to optimize that mix design by um, three to five percent, and also sequester CO2. You know, it's a small amount of CO2 that's being sequestered, but it's you know it's first of its kind technology that we're able to do and, and to do so you know to, to sequester CO2 in concrete. Even though concrete itself during the life of that concrete, it is sequestering CO2 over time, but there's an, there hasn't been a way to really um, um, calculate that of how much, you know, calculate how much CO2 concrete sequesters. But this is something that we could, um, we could, uh, we could calculate and determine how much CO2 we're injecting in our concrete. Um, let me go through this quickly. This is just fibers. We talked about ways and strategies, you know, the use of additives to optimize SEM percentages. And fibers is a great way to make sure we have that concrete put together. And it's also a great way maybe, you know, do we replace rebar for a, for a composite slab? Can we replace rebar? If we can, you could use synthetic fibers and it will lower your GWP of the building itself. Um, if you're doing a whole building life cycle analysis on the building. Um, in most cases in this market, it's harder because it is a seismic zone. Um, also ex using um, expanded joint spacing um, for the contractors, they could expand their joints um, with, um, with fibers. And we do have engineers that help um, determine the, both of these different calculations if we could replace fibers with, uh, use um, and replace rebar with fibers or replace welded wire mesh for fibers. Johnny, before you move on, I uh, want to step back to carbon cure for a moment, just to let everybody know just how common this is becoming uh, in our community, right? So, you know, we work regularly hand in hand with uh, some really great structural engineers like DCI Engineering or KPFF. And this is a standard specification uh, for both of them. So, the, you know, the, the structural engineers, you know, as an association, they're committed to being uh, carbon neutral by 2050. And there's a lot of engineering firms that are members of uh, that group that are committed to doing it before then. And carbon cure is, is part of the solution as well. So a standard specification with, with the best structural engineers. And then I also saw a comment come in, Mike, if you can pull it up uh, on the question of rebar uh, that I think is relevant since we're talking about re rebar replacement right now. I didn't see something on rebar. I only have the chloride corrosion resistance and asking to expand on that. Okay, maybe that's what I was thinking. Thank you. Yeah, chloride sorry. corrosion, yeah. So we're talking about, I'm sorry, go ahead, Mike. Uh, what is the definition? What does that mean? Yeah, so <clears throat> when we're talking about the, um, the RCP test, um, that's a test that it's done in the lab. It's a it's a solution that has chlorides in it, and it's and it's pressurized and run through the concrete cylinder, and the the apparatus determines how much chlorides went through that concrete under um, that evaluation, 
And the less, the less chlorides that, or ions that go through that concrete, the less permeable or the more permeable that concrete is. If you have more ions going through that, you know, the less permeable it is. Hope I help answer that question. Yeah, I think you're good to go we'll move on. Okay. So moving on to aggregates, <clears throat> we talked in the beginning, we talked about aggregates. Sometimes we may have to import aggregates for, for, um, off the, for building these structures that we're building, right? And constructing these massive structures with um, high performance concrete that we need to deliver. This is a, a, you know, a graph just really showing the, the amount of aggregate you have in a concrete mix design. Um, although aggregate don't contribute a large amount to the embodied carbon, but they do play a role in your concrete performance. You have about 60 to 70% of that volume of a concrete, of a concrete volume is aggregate. So ag aggregate quality plays a big role. And th this is data just showing, I'm gonna go from, I'm gonna go clockwise here, identifying each of these items. You have modulus of elasticity test data at 56 days and we're comparing uh, you know our local aggregate here with not locals imported orca aggregate it has 600 pounds of cement and a local aggregate that has 650 pounds of cement and although it has less cement it outperforms the local aggregate at 48 percent on modulus elasticity similar with the 56 day compressive strength the reason why we use 56 days is because we like to push out the um the FC prime of any concrete mixes to take advantage of sustainability because we talked about that arbitrary 28 day number. Um, you know, like, do we really need it? Some cases we do and, and, and some we don't. And you can just see the, you know, there's the ORCA aggregate has a 6% increase on um, that PSI at 56 days compared to the local. And this is just really showing the efficiency as well. Just looking the, at the, at the strength at the compressor strength at early age strength out to the 56 day later age strength and you can see the orca here in red is just outperforming that local aggregate and when we look at it as an embodied carbon it has an eight percent reduction these two you know these mix designs compared to each other another item i'd like to touch on is looking at the whole life cycle of concrete right in our industry we handle five percent of Ball volume produced five percent return to us, and um, you know they're, you know that's sent to landfills or recyclers. Base rock is made out of, but there's a man, there's an abundance of base rock out there, and sometimes it's it just they're trying to give it away. But what we like to do is is maybe make an artificial aggregate or maybe reuse and repurpose that. But before I go into that, just put that number in perspective. And our one of our highest volume years. We had 90,000 cubic yards come back that we had to handle. That to paint that, you know, to paint that picture, that's a football field that sits from goalpost to goalpost and extends 11 feet high. 90,000 cubic yards. So it's a lot of concrete that a ready mix producer um, may have to handle in a given year. <clears throat> One strategy is the use of, re of reusing fresh concrete. There's ACM standards out there available, but um, for the sake of time. Um, you know, the one that could be really used on projects is the use of an artificial aggregate or recycled concrete aggregate. There is municipalities that are using a specified a minimum of 15% recycled. And it's for certain applications, it's not for all applications, um, but um, these mixes range that we deliver um, have 80 to 100% recycled coarse aggregate and the PSI ranges from 3,000 to 5,000 PSI. For, um, you know, commercial projects out there, Maybe specified locations could be sand slurries or um, soil stabilization mixes. You know, recycled sand could be utilized for that type of application instead of um, virgin sand. Um, I know we had an engineer that was interested in using uh, using recycled aggregate for fill on metal decks and manholes and some footings as well. So, how do we implement you know some of these strategies? We talked about maturity a little, and this is just really showing the system that we use through maturity. And we have this 30% slag post-tension mix. 
through determination of the sensor inside that concrete slab, you could see that the heat generation and that PSI strength achieving at 3,000, I mean, 3,300 PSI at three days. Um, and this is really helpful for these, as I mentioned before, as early age or stripping of, of forms for projects. Another one is looking at specifications. Bringing in the ready mix producer early on in the conversation, identifying what is achievable for the project team, the contractor, and the ready mix producer. <clears throat> this is available on our website, and it just really helps, um, you know, communicate for the architects at least communicate to the engineers or to the owners, and look at different strategies. Is not meant to be read here, but um, there's barriers that we see in specifications. Barriers such as minimum minimum cement content maximum water cement ratio and maximum SEM contents. So the first column there or the first um, row there talks about the intended purpose of that specification. And then we talk about the missed opportunities when when you have that type of speci specification in concrete. And then the last row here talks about the alternative methods of achieving the intended purpose. So it's useful um, and it is available on our website. If anyone's interested, I can put a link on at the, at the end of this presentation here is looking at, you know, putting a maximum water cement ratio limit on a specification. And you have three different mix, excuse me, four different mixes. You have 100% cement, 25% fly ash, 50% um, ternary mix, cement, slag, and fly ash, and a 70% ternary. And you can see the GWP reduction based off of the family mixes of 0.45 water cement ratio to a 0 0.50 water cement ratio, you have a 7 to 12% reduction just by alleviating that water cement ratio limit. You could take advantage of that reduction. And through collaboration, right, we talked about how, how is this implemented? Really, you know, the, it's it's working um, in, on projects early on, like we did with Pankow here for this project. Um, this is a project profile that we call. and um, to, 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 to highlight the different graphs that we have here, the one on the top right there, that's a pie graph showing and demonstrating what should we be targeting on this project? You know, cause you have metal, fill on metal deck at 60% of, of that concrete greenhouse gas emissions coming from that application. You have slab on grade and, and, and so forth. So, you know, through collaboration, identifying the cement replacements that we could take advantage of for each of these applications. Now we compare what we delivered. Um, sorry, is that, should, should we have a, so we have 11% based off the Marin County and 33% reduction compared to the National Ready Mix Association industry average. And um, this is what we were able to um, um, deliver to, to the project here on 1951 Harbor. And just really going back on the collaboration and going back to what Michael said about there is no one silver bullet. There's different strategies on a project for different applications that we could achieve. And this graph is just really showing, you know, what can we do for columns and walls? What can we do for topping slabs and suspended slabs, foundations and post-tension slabs? Different strategies, um, you know, contractors understanding of using that these SCMs at higher percentages and it's about um, working together um, to get to that goal of, of reducing the greenhouse gas emissions or reducing the body carbon of concrete. I think I got about 10 minutes left. Um, so I think we're, this is the end of this presentation for, for my end, but um, we know we're open for questions and some Q and A. Looks like uh, Mark Michael Carradine has them. What's the cost comparison of the various mixes? Yeah, so you know the way we've approached the market has been cost neutral. The reason why is because at the end of the day, concrete is looked at as a commodity, um, and and it's going to be hard bid. You know, our customers are going to go for the lowest concrete bid. Um, 
and sustainability hasn't been the focus on any of these projects. Um, so it's kind of, there's, at least for concrete, there hasn't been a value um, for, for, for low carbon concrete. So there, there hasn't been an opportunity for, for us to, um, to market that in that way. So we have to be competitive to win a concrete project and it's been, you know, it's cost neutral. Yeah, I would just I would just add to that, Mike and Johnny, that that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's you know when when Johnny first told us that this summer, I was like, okay, great. And then I went back to our concrete group and said, okay, he said this stuff's cost neutral. Is it really cost neutral? And they said, yeah, it's actually cost neutral. So they've been a good right. partner. This is another question from Tyler Bradshaw. Has anyone studied when the demand for ash slash slag? as PC replacement will exceed the availability from producers. I expect that it has a cl uh, that we close down more coal plants, fly ash supply should be going down over time. Not sure about slag. So supply chain in regard to those elements. Oh yeah, supply chain is definitely getting tighter. And I'm sure you guys have seen in some of your projects, especially 2020. 2020 was unique here and just in everything and <laughs> what occurred. But um, so, Fly ash, you have power plants shutting down, and that's going to happen. Um, I don't expect power, coal power plant to be in operation maybe in 10 years from now. Um, I, do, I haven't seen a study or, or reviewed a study on it, but this is just me looking, you know, being in the industry and understanding the challenges that we're facing. Um, but there are imports. There's other countries producing um, fly ash and using um, coal power plants. So instead of that material going out to a landfill, it's being imported to be used in concrete. At least that's here in this market. Uh, um, but we, we do have a national research lab um, and they're working on looking at different um, natural pozzolins that are available here in California, looking at different SEMs that could be utilized, electric furnace for the slag side. Um, you know, maybe investigating, can that be used instead of your traditional um, slag manufacturing that comes from um, iron ore and, and, and when it's quenched or whatnot. But, you know, that's that's a great thing about being part of U.S. Concrete, where now we're, we're Vulcan, which has been acquired by Vulcan Materials. Um, but, you know, they have the same, um, they have the same approach in, in regards to sustainability and you know we're just lucky to have the National Research Lab here in the Bay Area, where where all the technology is you know at the forefront. Okay, well I don't see any questions coming in. Um, last chance to put your questions out there for Johnny or Michael. No, well I do have a question myself since we do have some time, um, and this kind of goes back to what Tyler was asking about. Um, in the Bay Area, we seem to have a hyper focus and, you know, it's a pretty good market, but um, can you speak generally about the differentiation, um, as far as you know, nationally versus what's happening here in the Bay Area or Northern California? Yeah, and you mean in what's available in, in different parts of the country or just the appetite for sustainability? Well, adoption of these alternate concretes is pr probably the core of my question. Is this just a regional thing because we're us here, or is this something that we're seeing uh, market opportunity nationally? Well, sure, you know, yeah. Johnny, before you take a run at yeah. that, I'll, I'll just share, share something anecdotally. I was on a, a carbon cure program, I don't know, six or eight weeks ago, and met the chief operating officer, um, Sheil Sexton. Uh, they're a general contractor, about a billion dollars a year in volume, uh, Midwest, and just a really sharp guy. And uh, we connected afterwards. We got together and I was talking to him about it. He said, you know, one of the things that we love so much about Carbon Cure is, is for a change, we're driving the change, the technological change within the industry from the Midwest out to the coasts. He said, you know, I get so many calls today from GCs on the East Coast and on the West Coast saying, tell me about your carbon cure experience. And he said, we've been doing it here for years. So to the, to the extent that the topic 
the question that you're asking is limited to carbon cure. It's as prevalent or more prevalent in the Midwest and it's working its way out to the coasts. In regards to these other strategies though, I'll, I'll let you take that one, Johnny. For sure. Um, I do I do see we are in a unique situation or a new, unique place here, right, with the whole sustainability. Just looking at Southern California, they're, the appetite is growing down there, but it's just, they don't have the same, the same logistical benefits that we have out here, right? They don't have the terminals like we have with the imports. Um, I think they're trying to establish that and create that. The reason for that is because that market, it's, it's, a, it's a vertically integrated market for ready mix producers. There's a lot more cement concrete producers that, that also produce cement. So there hasn't been an, an, a, a business strategy for a ready mix producer to really go in that direction. We've been doing or promoting sustainability back in 2003, you know, we went hard in 2008. We were the first adopters in creating EPDs for our concrete mixes. Um, and that's because we're not vertically integrated. So we had that flexibility. Um, so, it, and, and honestly, I think it's this, this wave of, of, of promotion on sustainability from the AIA community to the engineering community now with 2050, SE 2050. Um, ready mix producers are, are, that are vertically integrated. They're seeing that they need to adopt and need to change. Similar with cement. You know, cement's been, they've been punched in the face so many times in the past couple of years where they're finally trying to create these strategies and, and create um, a way to produce less um, or more sustainable cement. Um, so it's, it's just really, it's all really market dependent and, and what's, what are the local sources? I have a great question because although it may be elementary to many, um, Samuel Harrison asks, very basic question, what makes the glue of concrete? Cement. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was uh, a, a, great, a great presentation. I feel like I learned a lot. Um, I'm wondering if uh, Evan or Ben have any last comments before we wrap up our session today? I was going to ask a question, just any, any final thoughts and, and uh, recommendations for us architects who are not necessarily, you know, deep in uh, uh, concrete specifications. Most of the time, our consult, uh, structural engineers uh, do that, but I do see uh, often on these public bid projects, you know, last minute substitutions and, you know, pressure from these small contractors to, um, you know, to, to push in some early strength concrete and, and argue that and into uh, substituting for just a standard concrete. So any final thoughts for us architects? Well, sure. I'll take the first run at that. As, as a general contractor, I would say design beautiful things that don't have to be covered up. Right. I, I heard that said recently and I, and I love that, right. Design something beautiful so that we don't have to clad it, you know, whether it's regardless of what it's made of. Right. Uh, so I'll keep it short and brief. It's like keep designing cool things. We don't have to cover up. <laughs> I like that. That's really good, actually. Um, yeah. So I'm going to, copy and paste that specification guide. You know, that's a good read. If I find any other specifications or, or even you know, ways to, to specify and, and have an understanding, um, you know, have that intelligent conversation with, with um, whether it's the owner or the engineer, um, I, could, I could share that with Michael and he could share it with the team or, or Evan. Um, another, you know, look at Marin County and what they develop. You know, yeah. there was a working group that really came together. We were a part of that conversation and they have really good, good limits for this area that you could try to promote and, 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 put, and put limits on, on what concrete you're trying to get back out there. 
exciting. Well, thank you. Very informative. For sure. Do you have any final thoughts, Evan? No, I think we're out of time. I just want to say thanks again to, to both Juan and Michael. Uh, I, I enjoyed it the first time and I, I learned more the second time. So <laughs> if anyone's like me, you, you kind of have to go over this stuff a few times before it really sinks in. But uh, uh, I, was, I was happy to have the opportunity to, to see it again. Thank you. Thanks, Evan. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you all. Appreciate it. Thanks,